So hi, welcome to another episode of History Hunters. I think I probably picked the windiest day of the year to visit this cemetery in Merced. And they're doing construction work on the street that leads to the cemetery. So we have been to this cemetery before. Stephen Stainer is buried here. You may have watched that video. And we also did a video on James McCauley, who was an early Yosemite National Park settler. He's also buried here. So there's a viewer by the name of Art Coleman. He contacted me and told me that Tommy Duncan of Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys is buried here at this cemetery. And I thought it would be a great way to introduce you to him if you don't know anything about him. He was pretty big in Western swing in 1930s, 1940s, and 50s up until his death in 1967. He died at what I consider a very young age. I'm going to tell you all about him on this episode of History Hunters. The other thing that's kind of complicating this visit, besides the wind and the construction work that's taking place out in front of the cemetery, is the fact that they're having a funeral service right now over in the Haven of Rest section, which is where Tommy Duncan is buried. And I'm trying to keep my distance for a while. So I think what I'm going to do is let that funeral service kind of wind down a little bit before I head over there. But in the meantime, I want to find the grave of the first sheriff of Merced County, who is named Eldridge Rector. And I quickly found Sheriff Rector, he's right here. E.G. Rector, born in Tennessee, 1816. He died in Merced, California in 1902. Look at all this construction work done right out here. Sorry for the noise, completely tore up the road. So it's kind of hard to deal with that while I'm trying to talk. So the interesting thing about Mr. Elbridge Rector is that his father had served in the uh, War of 1812 and his grandfather served in the American Revolution. And El Rector himself went to Texas in 1835 and he joined the Texas Army the following year and he was fighting at the Battle of San Jacinto against the Army of Santa Ana. In fact, he was wounded twice in that conflict and later joined the Texas Rangers where he was involved in the Indian Wars. When the Mexican-American War broke out in 1847, he also participated in the invasion of Mexico and served until Mexico surrendered. So when you come to a cemetery like this, you really don't know anything about their history. Now, somebody might visit his grave and not know anything about it, but think about the, the battles that he saw, just the incredible amount of, of action. And uh, I guess he thought he was fighting for the right cause. A lot of people today might uh, question whether or not it was appropriate to try to take Mexico away from Mexico. Then he came to California, tried his hand at mining, then he went ranching. He ultimately settled here on Merced River, became active in local politics, became a county clerk. He was county clerk for seven years and then he was elected sheriff in 1864. Back when things were wild and woolly here. He served two terms. Mrs. Rector, who is buried right over here, much younger, I noticed. She died in Berkeley on February 14th, 1927, at the age of 96. So the funeral service is still going on. I'm gonna to try to kill some time by uh, checking out some other graves here. Occasionally a trip to the cemetery allows us to learn new facts and seeing the Garibaldi grave plot caused me to stumble upon a new discovery. Buried here is John B. Garibaldi and his mother Catherine, who departed in 1896. John Garibaldi was born in 1867 to Italian immigrants living in Mariposa County. After the Central Pacific Railroad created the town of Merced in 1872, the Garibaldis moved here. In October 1894, John became postmaster of Merced. After his term expired in October of 1899, James ran the Garibaldi store in Yosemite National Park for several years. He returned to Merced to again sell groceries until 1919 while holding the office of county tax collector. He died in 1932. This monument right here is for the Turners. It's like William Turner. He died in 1910. He was 72 years old. Now I know that there's some Turners who were involved with the Dalton brothers out at Hills Ferry and I'm assuming that this could be a relative. And we've got the son, Willie, 
he died at 21 months. Wuthi died at eight months. And Gracia died at one month. Sometimes you'll come to a cemetery and notice that the, the ground is shifting underneath it. There's a lot of weight there. Eventually that thing's gonna topple. They don't do anything about it. Memory of Theodore Peter Camosi. He was born in Switzerland, 1830, and he died here, 1878. He's buried right next to a German immigrant, died in Tulare in 1900, erected by his friend G. Garibaldi. See, he had some money. That guy even bought this nice marker for his friend. You certainly find all kinds of markers here. This is for Cunningham. It looks like he was a mason, but it's a massive chunk of stone. It looks like maybe granite, but carved very elaborately. Just think of the skills that they used way back. You go from rough stone here to flat here. I don't know how they even do something like that. Ornate scrolling. That is so cool. I have long questioned whether there would be any way that you could possibly continue this practice of using a lot of stone for just one family's marker. You know, the billions of people who've died and been buried over the years, I don't think there's enough stone quarries that would produce the stone that was required to put these elaborate markers. Some of them must weigh tons. I mean, that one over there probably weighs as much as a car or more, probably two cars. Here's another example of a very huge marker for the Bowman family. That's a lot of stone there. So right behind this large tree is a grave that I thought was interesting because that last name could be associated with the McSwain Lake, which is above Merced. This is the grave of Martha, wife of James McSwain. She died 1884. She was 59 years old. Over here is an interesting grave plot. It's that of the Hamiltons. Uh, look at this name right here. It's funny to find names that are associated with famous names. Alexander Hamilton, born, died in 1903. He has a pretty cool face there on his marker. So right here in the Heron plot, I noticed a couple of interesting names and I just wonder if they're related to the famous Wild Bill Hickok. There's Noah Hickok. 1802 to 1884. Elizabeth Hickok, 1814 to 1902. Emmeline Heron died in 1918. And Charles Heron died in 1900. I think it would be just so cool if we find a connection between these Hickoks and Wild Bill Hickok, who died in Deadwood, South Dakota, and he was shot in the saloon. Okay, good news, it looks like the funeral service close to where Tommy Duncan is buried is over. So I'm gonna move in there and tell you a little bit about him. So I'm finally here at the grave of Thomas Elmer Duncan. He lived from 1911 to 1967. He was only 57 years old. He was a legendary Western swing musician who toured with Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. He has a very interesting past. Besides being a popular singer, he was in a number of 1940s movies that featured Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. He appeared with Wills and other members of the band in such movies as Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys in 1944, Rhythm Roundup, Blazing the Western Trail, and Lawless Empire, all in 1945. So Tommy was born in Hillsborough, Texas. He was one of 14 children. At the age of 13, he decided to run away from home and go to the big city and busk for a living. I guess he had an interest in singing and music at a very early age. In 1932, he was in Fort Worth, Texas. He was busking at a root beer stand when he decided to audition against 64 other singers to be part of the Light Crust Doughboys. It's a popular singing group in Texas that made its way to the radio and they were recording records by then. When band leader Bob Wills decided to form a band, he and Duncan became the creative force of the Texas Playboys. Duncan was versatile in his singing style and repertoire was credited with a great range that was ideal for dance music that Wills performed and recorded. 
He sang everything from ballads and folk to pop, Timpan Alley, Broadway, blues, and cowboy songs. As a lyricist, he contributed to New San Antonio Rose in 1940. The recording, with Duncan on vocals, sold 3 million copies for Columbia Records. Duncan soon set the standard for Western swing vocals. So when I was a boy, I had a great Aunt Alice who was into country music. She was just loved Roy Rogers and just fawned all over those type of personalities. And I always remember that uh, the song San Antonio Rose was interesting to me because Bob Wills would always go, oh, San Antonio Rose. Just a really strange way to perform, I think. Come in, Tommy. Deep within my heart lies a melody, yeah. a song of old San Antonio. San Antonio. Where in dreams I live with a memory. Oh. Beneath the stars all along all It was there I found Beside the owl Enchantment strange as the blue oh, Up above oh. A moonlit path That, that only she, she would know. know Still here's my broken oh, sound of love 1942 He actually recorded his first hit Which was Time Changes Everything It's kind of a gold mine for him He started making some money and as his career was taking off, his wife Willie Mae died suddenly in Texas. He used the royalties from that song to help bury her. When you left me, my poor heart was broken. Our romance seemed all in vain. The dark clouds are gone and there's blue skies again. Cause time changes everything. Tommy Duncan was a patriot. When he heard that Pearl Harbor was bombed, he did what a lot of able-bodied young American male men did, and that's volunteer for the service. He was the first one out of the Texas Playboys to actually volunteer to join the armed services. Now, that was in 1941, and he was discharged because he had a kidney disease or something, and he rejoined with Bob Wills in 1944. Now, friends, our version of Goodbye, Liza Jane. Wills and his band moved to Fresno in 1945 and toured up and down the coast. For more than a year, they played a weekly gig at Bakersfield's Beardsley Ballroom. At least once a month, the show was broadcast live on radio, and one of those who listened to the show was Merle Haggard. In fact, Merle said in his autobiography that, quote, Bob Wills' band was the best in the history of live radio. While Haggard learned about being an effective band leader from Bob Wills, it was Tommy Duncan who was one of Merle's greatest influences as a front man. Quote, I think the first to impress me with his good singing voice was Tommy Duncan, wrote Haggard in his 1981 autobiography, Send Me Back Home. When Duncan played in a show in Hanford in the Central Valley, not far from Bakersfield, Merle, who was a young guitar picker, was called to play guitar to play with Duncan. Merle was thrilled and turned red-faced at the opportunity. Besides Merle Haggard, it was said that Duncan had an influence on Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Ray Price, Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, Roy Orbison, and even Buddy Holly. It is said that Duncan was a virtual human jukebox who memorized the lyrics and melodies to more than 3,000 songs. Duncan also was a multi-instrumentalist who could play the guitar, piano, and bass. Duncan joined Wills in writing several more numbers, including New Spanish Two-Step, 1945, Stay a Little Longer, 1945, Cotton Eye Joe, 1946, and Sally Gooden, 1947. One of his biggest hits was inspired by a night at a bar visiting songwriter Cindy Walker. Duncan motioned for her to look at a gentleman sitting a few tables away who was just staring at his glass of beer. Duncan commented to her that he's just watching the bubbles in his beer. Instantly, they both realized they had an idea for a new song, and Bubbles in My Beer became one of the staples of Western Swing. Except for Faded Love, sung by Rusty McDonald, every Texas Playboy song that was a hit featured Duncan on vocals, cementing his status as the finest vocalist that Wills ever had. In time, it was Bob Wills' drinking that became a problem, and he would often miss shows, and when the headliner failed to perform, the band's pay reverted to Union Scale. By 1948, Duncan was tired of Wills' drinking and complained about him one night. One night before a performance, Wills overheard Duncan and told guitarist Eldon Shamblin to fire him. Tommy set out to form his own western swing group, Tommy Duncan and his All-Star Westerns, which featured his younger brother, Glenn. Another brother who joined him was Joe Duncan. 
The band had lasted about two years because musical tastes had changed, and attendance at the Western All Stars dances ranged from fair to poor, certainly not enough to sustain a large band. Duncan and Wills reunited, and from 1959 to 1961, they rekindled much of their former success. By this time, Duncan's voice had evolved to a mature, mellow croon, which he had used to his greatest effect. But when Wells began drinking, Duncan left again and made personal appearances with various bands. Wells' band never achieved the same level of success it had with Duncan, and Duncan's solo efforts mostly paled in comparison to Wills. Roly poly, eating corn and taters, hungry every minute of the day. Roly poly, gnawing on a biscuit, long as he can chew it, it's okay. He can eat an apple pie and never even blink an eye. He likes everything from soup to hay. Holy bully, daddy's little fatty. I bet he's gonna be a man someday. As a member of the Texas Playboys, Duncan was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1999 as an early influencer. He was also inducted into the Texas Music Hall of Fame. So in the 1960s, Tommy was living on a 260-acre ranch up near Mariposa County, which is in the mountains uh, just east of here. And uh, he was living there with his wife, Marie, uh, enjoying life. He had some health problems, and I suspect that he was a smoker because he did have heart problems. In July 1967, he was performing down in Imperial Beach in San Diego County, pretty close to San Diego. And uh, he, on July 24th, 1967, was found dead in his hotel room just sprawled out on the floor. He apparently died of a heart failure, and the authorities found in his possession uh, some heart medication, so he had been taking medication for his heart. He's pretty young to die. He's 57. So I want to thank you for joining us on this episode of History Hunters. We hope that you appreciate Tommy Duncan a little more. I know that I do. I sometimes do these videos and I found out a lot of research about people I never knew about before and this is certainly one of them. We'd love to know if you listen to Tommy Duncan's music, maybe even went to one of his concerts. I don't know if there's people still alive that remember seeing him perform. There probably are, but I would love to hear your comments about this video. We always appreciate a thumbs up. Thank you so much.